Thank you. I've been an athlete my entire life, from Little League Baseball as a kid, track and field, and even 13 years of classical ballet. As an adult, my athletic adventures have taken me a little bit more adventurous, uh, lots of places around the world, helped me find balance, and also helped me stay fit or stay in shape. But I, like much of the rest of the world, am fascinated by elite athletes from the world record 100-meter sprint of Usain Bolt, the strength and agility of the Williams sisters, Michael Phelps and his 18 Olympic gold medals. Why are we so fascinated with elite athletes? It's exciting. They're inspiring. The camaraderie, cheering for our home team, our home country, or our favorite event. But for me, Personally, it's also about the science. I have a PhD in physiology, and I've spent my career studying and researching how athletes function. However, the athletes I'm most passionate about and curious about live here. So my first goal of the evening, or of the morning, is to convince you that fish are the true gold medal athletes of the world. So what's so remarkable about fish? There are about 28,000 species of fish on the planet today. Bear in mind, we as humans are only one species. They make up over 50% of all vertebrate species on the planet today. That's over half of all animals with a backbone. They also have 400 million years of evolution behind them. That's 2,000 times longer than we humans have been on the planet. And over those 400 million years, they've evolved to occupy nearly every body of water on the planet, and while doing so, cope with an array of environmental conditions. Fish have a dominant presence in their ecosystems because of their size, the way they move, and their importance to food webs, including our own. But athletes? Turns out that there are a lot of similarities between what we understand in human athletes and fish athletes. Maybe not the salaries, but whether you're a fish athlete or a human athlete, the bottom line is that performance requires oxygen. Oxygen to deliver to our tissues, such as our brain, our heart, our muscles. The obvious difference here is that while we get our oxygen from the air that we breathe, fish must get their oxygen from the water. This is where things get a bit tricky for fish. There's a lot less oxygen in water than there is in air. In fact, if you think about it this way, fish have to use 30 buckets of water to get the same amount of oxygen that we could get in one bucket of air. Water is also very dense, viscous, heavy, so fish have to be very efficient to get oxygen from their water. And this starts at the gill. Very similar to how we use our lungs to take in oxygen from the air we breathe, a fish usually uses its gill to take oxygen from the water that it breathes. Now, the gill has an immense surface area, so it can come in contact with as much water and therefore get as much oxygen as possible. The gill also has other jobs. Just like when we exhale carbon dioxide, the gill can help remove carbon dioxide. It can help the fish balance ions in its environment, pH, and also help with immune function. Just like us, fish also have a heart that moves their blood around their body to help deliver that oxygen to those tissues. And just like us and nearly every other animal on the planet, fish have a very special protein in their blood called hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin is so good at grabbing oxygen as it's dissolved in blood from the environment and moving with the blood through the body and delivering it to tissues. But this is really where fish have us beat. Some of the work that I've done, I've been able to figure out that fish hemoglobin can deliver oxygen to tissues 50 times better than what we understand in air breathers like ourselves. 50 times. Can you imagine being able to do something 50 times better than the person sitting next to you right now? We think that this is part of the key to their success over 400 million years of evolution and as athletes of the ocean. So if we think of fish in the same way we think of elite human athletes, yeah, some of the top performers do come to mind. The mackerels, the tunas, the sailfishes, some of the fastest and most exciting fish in the ocean. They're prized by anglers because of the fight, the way they leap into the water, and the way their torpedo-like bodies just glide through the ocean, rivaling any human athlete. In fact, 
Usain Bolt has the world record 100 meter sprint at just over nine and a half seconds. If a bluefin tuna was doing this race, it would finish it in three seconds. For endurance, the salmon take the gold. Just about this time of year, on the west coast of Canada, the Pacific salmon will have one last meal before it leaves the ocean and travels nearly a thousand kilometers upriver. While doing so, maybe jumping up waterfalls, uh, fending off other salmon, avoiding bears, and even traversing different temperatures in their water. Why do this? For sex. They do this to spawn for the very last time of their life to ensure the next generation survives of salmon. Adults out there, for how long or how far would you swim just to hook up for the very last time? <laughs> a thousand kilometers? Therein lies the difference. What we understand from human athletes and human fitness, how we measure it in terms of strength, speed, agility, how we measure the, the success of human athletes or human fitness in distances, record times, gold medals, and even our motivation to stay fit or stay athletic. Maybe it's fame and fortune, or maybe just personal health goals, or to fit into nice clothing, is extremely different from the rest of the animals on the planet, which is biological fitness. Sure, we do look at strength, agility, speed in other animals, but the way we measure success and the motivation in terms of biological fitness comes down to two things only, survival and sex, ensuring a next generation of a species survives. So in other words, for these athletes, the consequences of losing the game are extinction. So what's really great is that no matter tuna, salmon, or blobfish, we have to consider athleticism in terms of biological fitness, and that's how we have to measure it. But what's really neat is that a lot of the technology we use to do that comes from human athletes. Elite athletes are often tested to measure the amount of oxygen their body can take in while they're maximally performing at their sport. We can do this with fish as well, in little aquatic treadmills. We can adjust the speed against which they're swimming to simulate different swimming conditions and monitor the amount of oxygen they're using while they're swimming at maximal speed. We can also turn off the speed and measure how much oxygen it costs them to just rest. Kind of like if you're just sitting on the couch doing absolutely nothing. These are your basic maintenance costs. We can also measure the amount of oxygen it costs for growth, digestion, and reproduction. All of these things feeding into biological fitness. So let me take you to where I've been studying athletes for the past few years, the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest coral reef in the world. It spans for about 2,300 kilometers up and down the east coast of Australia and is home to 1,500 fish athletes. Sure, most of the athletes look a little bit more like this, but we do have our fair share of elite athletes on the Great Barrier Reef. But one thing that the Great Barrier Reef is facing right now is global climate change human-induced climate change. Although this is the most well-protected coral reef ecosystem in the world, it is not immune to what we are causing. So the increase in carbon emissions, burning of fossil fuels, are resulting in ocean warming, ocean acidification, and the increase in industrial and agricultural development is also putting a toll on water quality conditions. So these are three of the factors that I've been looking at with the athletes of the Great Barrier Reef. With one main question, this 400 million years of evolutionary successes of athletes, is it enough for them to continue to adapt and survive climate change? For example, ocean warming. We know that the oceans are warming, maybe even 2.6 to 4.8 more degrees over the next century. And unfortunately, in the tropics where we are here, and also closer to the equator, the organisms here are expected to feel most of the brunt of this warming. And that's because they've evolved in a very narrow range of temperatures over their entire life. That is, on a seasonal basis, they don't experience a wide range of temperatures. 
So we've been looking at the effects of increased temperatures in several species of coral reef fishes in the northern parts of the Great Barrier Reef and closer to the equator. And just like with the little fish treadmill, we look at the cost or the amount of oxygen required for basic maintenance and the amount of oxygen required for swimming or other activities. And what we're finding with just a two or three degree increase in temperature, this is imposing a great stress on these species of coral reef fishes. This great stress is adding to those basic maintenance costs. So just being more expensive to be alive. It's also reducing their capacity for swimming activities as well. We think that these increases in basic maintenance costs are due to some of the changes that are happening at the gill. Remember that beautiful surface area at the gill that's responsible for getting so much oxygen into the body. Well, with just a two or three degree increase in temperature, that surface area is almost gone. Those nooks and crannies, that beautiful gill filament, are filled in by protective cells, by mucus, and it's reducing that surface area that's so critical for getting as much oxygen from the water as possible. This isn't just an adult fish problem. Baby Nemo here, when it hatches uh, from a little egg, will swim for maybe two or three weeks looking for an ideal coral reef to call home. And during this time, it's swimming a lot, it's using a lot of energy, and it's having to eat a lot to grow. But with just a two or three degree increase in temperature, we know that plankton supply in the ocean declines. So that means less food is available for baby Nemo here, and it has to do a lot more swimming in order to find enough food. Meaning that maybe less energy is being devoted to growth and development. Problems with baby fish mean problems with adult fish which means problems with the whole ecosystem. Another byproduct of increased carbon emissions is ocean acidification. Burning of fossil fuels and emissions into the atmosphere, 30% are being absorbed by the oceans. This is increasing the carbon dioxide in the oceans, which is decreasing the pH and causing ocean acidification. Now, what we know about the effects of ocean acidification on fish athletes is quite variable, actually. We think that maybe it'll be more expensive for them to balance pH with their gill, so it'll cost a little bit more energy. And so a lot of what we're seeing is in terms of energy savings and trade-offs between different activities. In fact, this cinnamon clownfish here, we found that it increases reproduction when it's being held under these end-of-century CO2 conditions or ocean acidification, but at the cost of increased maintenance and reduced swimming. We have other species of coral reef fishes that we've been looking at that actually enhance their athletic performance or even exhibit no change in their athletic performance. But there is a cost for these fish as well at the level of behavior. They're making poor choices. They might be better athletes, but they're making poor choices. And that's another similarity to our human athletes, right? So, unfortunately, if a fish is making poor choices, no matter how athletic it is, it could end that fish up in the mouth of a predator, okay? Another byproduct of climate change right now is the increase in, in industrial and agricultural development, increases in storm frequency and storm severity, which is really putting a detriment to our water quality in the, in the form of runoff, pollution, increases in sediment and turbidity in the water. And this is posing a great threat for our fish athletes as well. Little Nemo again here. When it hatches into clear, beautiful water, we see that gill surface area, lots of folds, beautiful surface area. However, when Nemo here hatches in turbid water, where a lot of sediment is suspended, we see that that surface area again disappears. It's being filled in by mucus cells, protective cells. We think to protect that delicate gill tissue from the mechanical damage of the sediments in the water. We also think that this is maybe why it's delaying development for this fish. And this is causing real problems in terms of fish populations on coral reefs today, even. So, well, these are three scenarios that I've been investigating so far over the past few years in our Great Barrier Reef athletes. We know that neither any of them will occur in isolation, and we do have to look at the combined effects of 
ocean warming, ocean acidification, and declining water quality. And we also have to look at how these changes are occurring over multiple generations in the form of adaptation. Are these 400 million years of evolution enough to keep them making those changes to survive climate change? And if not, we do have to be prepared for massive biogeographical redistributions of species and populations to more favorable habitats, more favorable temperatures, less pollution, maybe even higher latitudes, or extinction. Again, the consequences of losing the game are dire. So I do still reserve that these are the true athletes of the ocean, 400 million years behind them and in unparalleled capacity to deliver oxygen to their tissues. But is this the training facility that our athletes deserve? I think not. I would like to leave with one challenge. Can we devote the time and the energy and the passion and the excitement we have for our human athletes back to the rest of, of the world and the rest of the planet? and maybe create or maintain these biological fitness facilities where our athletes are maybe challenging the race of their lives, the race for survival. No matter how elite the athlete, I think they deserve the very best. Thank you. <laughs>